They are in, we are in the office of Dr. Ralph Prin, who works at the Leibniz Institute uh, for Baltic Sea Research. Uh, Dr. Prin is a director uh, of the Chemistry Sensors, uh, Chemical Sensors Work Group. So I'm uh, going to ask you a few questions, uh, some general questions about you, and then about your research and marine chemistry, etc., mm -hmm. etc. Et um, so, uh, first of all, could you tell us uh, briefly a little bit about your scientific career? Well, I, I started uh, studying physics, so I'm a physicist by training, and I, I did my master's uh, degree in applied physics already, in a working group uh, that worked on marine parameters and sensors. So that's mm -hmm. when it all started, really. Right. And then I did my PhD there as well, uh, after my PhD, I went uh, to England, uh, mm -hmm. to Southampton, to the National Oceanography Center there, and was working in the, in the census group there. Mm -hmm. uh, after six years in, in England, uh, we went back to Germany, and I started By we, here. We, can, we can say that you were there actually with your wife. Yes. Yes, exactly. That's interesting exactly. that you I, both I, were my working. my wife uh, being an, uh, a physical oceanographer by training and working interdisciplinary, so we had to find a, a, a job uh, at one institution mm -hmm. again in Germany. So we came back uh, to Germany and, and then mm -hmm. here to Warnemünde in the Leibniz Institute for Baltic Sea Research in the chemistry department. So mm -hmm. we are both. Uh, having a physics background more or less, mm -hmm. but uh, we are both working in the chemistry department. Right. From that you probably can infer that uh, this science is interdisciplinary in, in exactly. many respects. Exactly, exactly. Could you uh, tell us maybe what was the motivation for you to go uh, into scientific research? Yes, well, somehow I, I decided to study physics and when you go to university, you, you don't know really uh, what, what comes of it, mm -hmm. where you end up. I, I always saw myself working in industry some time or so. Mm -hmm. And then uh, with, with the time at the, uh, at the university and in, in this uh, Applied Physics uh, Institute, uh, I got more and more an interest in, in how things work and uh, that this uh, solving problems especially that, that engineering side of my work uh, in, in sensor development, that, that really got me, got me going and uh, interested me. And it's uh, also a, a job where you have many parts. You have the, the mechanical problems, mm -hmm. you have the electronics problems, you have problems in, in material science, and, and of course all, all the oceanography on the side as well. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. It, it's just fun and interesting. So, basically, it sounds like uh, you got the taste for science and for research uh, while you were studying. Yeah. And it's, it, it's something that developed rather than something that you would have had, let's say, from uh, childhood. Yeah, yeah exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so let's get a little bit into, into the, more into the science of, of what you do. Uh, I would be uh, interested in, uh, let's start with something that is actually really important for uh, marine chemistry, and, which is profiling. Yes. And it would be really interesting if you uh, could explain profiling uh, for us. Well, it's, uh, the, the problem with oceanography is that the oceans are really huge. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you get data, uh, you only get data in, in, in some points mm -hmm. of the huge ocean. And then, which also is a, a very intriguing field in itself, from these few observations do you then try to infer how it all works. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have the problem of undersampling. We don't have enough samples to really understand the system. And, and that's why I'm, I'm trying uh, in, in chemical oceanography to build sensors that uh, measure uh, some quantities, chemical quantities, mm -hmm. in situ, meaning in the water itself, mm -hmm. so that you don't need to, to get samples, 
uh, bring them home in the lab or bring them on the ship's lab mm -hmm. and then process them because then, then your, your number of samples is very limited. Uh, still, also with in situ sensors, uh, your sampling is limited because mm -hmm. you, uh, you go out with a ship usually and uh, you then profile and, and, and mm -hmm. what it is, if, if, you, if you have your ship uh, at yeah, okay. as a captain and you, you have a crane here and, and then you can lower an instrument down in the sea, mm -hmm. uh, you have a cable there and it connects to, to the computer on the ship. And is that winch? Well, it's the computer screen. Uh -huh. Of course, it's in the lab, so yeah. <laughs> you have a winch here, yeah, and, and, and then you let down an instrument package uh, through the water, and there you have the, the, the sensors on there, and you also have some, some sample bottles on there, mm -hmm. so that you can take actual water samples, because your in-situ sensors usually are not as good as the, the lab measurements. Right, 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 right. So uh, you need uh, to have some samples there to calibrate the, the sensor readings. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, you have actually only a, a very few sensors that are accurate enough that you don't need to do an in, in situ calibration from samples. Mm -hmm. And this is the temperature. The temperature you can measure uh, quite, quite uh, exactly mm -hmm. on about a thousandth of a degree centigrade uh, and you can also measure the conductivity uh, very good uh, and from the conductivity you can infer the salinity mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. the water mm -hmm. uh, but everything else is mm, yeah it's, it's then there is the third one which is depth yes that that is the pressure uh, that is the pressure mm -hmm. sensor so that you know the pressure and uh, all the water column of course Mm -hmm. is uh, is above this pressure sensor and, and so you, you know the pressure and, and from that and the density of the water you can then calculate the exact depth. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If, if you want a, uh, just over the, uh, over the thumb uh, calculation you can say that it's a, a decibar per meter depth. Okay, okay, okay. So, Right. So, uh, from what I have uh, learned when I visited the ship, I understand that this thing here is called a rosetta. Yes. And it's huge. Yeah, it, it is quite big. It's uh, um, maybe 1 meter 50 diameter mm -hmm. uh, in, in total. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, yeah, about a 1, meter, 1 meter 20 high. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, these bottles, uh, the, there are different uh, varieties, mm -hmm. uh, 5 mm -hmm. liter bottles, 10 liter bottles. Mm -hmm. Uh, for for doing the sampling, and it's interesting the way that they are actually filled with the with the sea water. They are actually open on the bottom and the top, mm -hmm. and at a specific uh, depth, these uh, the bottom and the top are closed shut. Yes, yeah, that that is because well, if you won't uh, would have them closed when when you go down, then of course you have air in the bottles, and then the pressure would. Uh, mm -hmm crash them. Right. So, so you have them open. Also then, then you have a freer flow of the water mm -hmm. through this open bottle and then uh, you, you just uh, get the, the uh, lids shut mm -hmm. and, and then you can, can get your sample up and on board. To return for a second to that uh, word the, which is profiling. Yes. Profiling basically means if you want to explain in this, with this diagram Yes, it is, uh, well, basically, as, as you go down, mm -hmm. uh, you have here your, your depth mm -hmm. uh, going down. That's mm -hmm. why we put it on the y-axis, although okay. it's the independent variable. In right, right, it's the independent axis. variable, exactly. Yeah. And yeah. Then, then you have, uh, for, for example, uh, you have your temperature here. Right, right, right. And, and uh, if this is the surface, uh, so you, you probably have a higher temperature there. Uh, because the sun heated the water, then it, then it goes down. Especially in, in, in the Baltic, you have some uh, winter water that goes down to, to something like 2 degrees. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe, maybe it's uh, depending on, on what time of year it is, right. 15. And, right. and then uh, it goes up uh, again to something like, like around 7 mm -hmm. in, in the deeper uh, realms. And, well, if we talk in... in talk the Baltic mm -hmm. and say deep water, 
then we already mean something like 200 meters, which in the open ocean is uh, really shallow. Right, right, so, right. So uh, in, in, in principle, the, for, for real blue uh, water oceanographers, uh, the Baltic Sea is a puddle. Yeah. But a very interesting one. Mm -hmm. So this is a good opportunity to, to mention uh, an in-house, so to say, product or feature that yes. I think uh, you guys are quite proud of. Yes, that is the the heave compensation exactly. that you are uh, mm -hmm. referring to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, maybe we you can write down so heave. Yeah, the the heave compensation. Mm -hmm. Heave. Heave. Okay. Compensation. Right. Right. And the, the problem that you have is uh, if you have a, a strong gradient like, like here, that there is a gradient of temperature in, in very uh, little vertical space, mm -hmm. the temperature increases by quite a bit. Right. Uh, now we have, uh, if that is, uh, for example, let's, let's say something like two meters, mm -hmm. and you have a steep gradient there, uh, if you let your instrument down, it, it goes down with something like uh, 30 centimeters per second, mm -hmm. uh, say, uh, 0.3 meters per second, then uh, the wave action actually moves your instrument up and down as it goes down. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's, it's not going uh, in, in, in one uh, monotone way, if right, you like, right. but it's going up and down. And this means because, uh, as you rightly said, this is quite a big instrument, so, so you mix through that gradient here, mm -hmm. and uh, you then smear this, uh, this uh, gradient, and, right. and you don't know exactly uh, what it is. Right, right, the heave right. compensation now, when, when the ship goes up, it, it lets out the cable, and if the ship ship goes down, it takes in mm -hmm. more cable, mm -hmm. so that you get a constant motion through the water column. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course it's much easier to do that if you only have something like 400 meters of cable on your uh, winch, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. than uh, for the open ocean where you have uh, something like 6,000 or 8,000 meters of cable mm -hmm. on, mm -hmm. on the winch. But uh, for measuring uh, through these uh, steep gradients, and, and we don't only have uh, gradients in temperature, but also in salinity mm -hmm. and, and therefore in oxygen and, and so on. Right. Uh, you need something like, like that, like the heave compensation to, to really uh, go through there and, and get, get good measurements. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So basically, heave compensation is um, a system that takes into account the, uh, the waves the uh, frequency of the waves and somehow tries to synchronize to, to them. Yeah, basically how, how it works is you have a, a, a motion unit in, in the ship mm -hmm. uh, and you have calculated the arm uh, to the point where the uh, winch cable goes down mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. deep mm -hmm. and so you compensate for that motion. Mm -hmm. You, you mm -hmm. calculate how fast is it going up or going down, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then uh, you give that command to the winch to, mm -hmm. to counter that movement mm -hmm. so, so that you right. get a, a steady motion right. of the instrument package. And it's trying, it's trying to anticipate the movement a little bit. Well, no, it's, it's just reacting. Very it is fast. reacting. Yeah, yeah, it's, oh, it's, it's, I see. Uh, ah. It's no forecasting, it's, it's mm -hmm. more like a now casting. Interesting, interesting. Uh, okay, well, this is information for me because all the time I thought that it's, it's uh, um, uh, determining the, the frequency of the waves. No, 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 and, it's, ah, it's just... Uh, the, it's it's the really reactive. Wave. Okay, okay, very interesting. Okay, let's talk a little bit about profiling in, in, that uh, is done not from a ship but with, this, with a mooring. Let's see what is a mooring. I see there's a, already a picture there. Yes, uh, maybe I, sh I should explain why why do we need that move. Right, right, right. That is, uh, we, we just talked about the waves uh, on the ship, mm -hmm. and that means uh, big movement, and sometimes the waves are so big that you can't really put that instrument over the side mm -hmm. because the waves are too high, mm -hmm. so you don't get a measurement. Mm -hmm. 
and also with the ship, uh, ship time is, is quite expensive. Mm -hmm. It's limited. Uh, and it's, it's limited, so you only get every now and then a cruise and, and then you go out and, and then you have one point in time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so to know what, what's happening in between, uh, we put down moorings and, mm -hmm. and uh, we have done that for a very long time. Mm -hmm. A mooring basically is uh, a string uh, uh, of, of rope with some instruments in mm -hmm. uh, that is held down by a bottom weight mm -hmm. and it's uh, held upright by some buoyancy that's on the top. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And usually you have uh, instruments in, in different depths of, of this uh, mooring uh, that then uh, uh, measure every minute, every hour or, or whatever you set it to mm -hmm. and, and uh, however long you want to record it. Right, so that's, that's one kind of mooring where you have instruments uh, already uh, uh, placed at preset yes. positions. Yeah. And then this, I think this might be the one where you have a winch. Yes, this is okay. a, a different one where you uh, really get a profile like you get uh, from the ship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you have, uh, the, the, the key is, a, is an underwater winch where you have a drum of line uh, and then a profiling instrumentation platform that has the buoyancy. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that's why it stays above the winch here mm -hmm. when, when, when it's uh, uh, doing nothing. Okay. So the, 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 the buoyancy uh, pulls this uh, instrument package up mm -hmm. and the, the bottom weight holds it down. Right. Now at pre-programmed times the winch uh, Un, uh, unhooks the, the, the cable here and this buoyancy can pull that instrument package up uh, through the water column mm -hmm. uh, and then pull it down again when the profile is ended mm -hmm. and park it in this depth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, parking in the depth has uh, quite, quite a few advantages. Mm -hmm. First of all, uh, that there's no problem with uh, ships that uh, are on the surface. It's in the deep, it's in the dark, and in the dark is uh, uh, interesting mm -hmm. because then we have no biology growing. Right. Most of the biology is, is growing with light in the upper water column. And if we have instruments that are up in the light, then they, they easily biofoul, so, so some biology right. is growing on them, right, and right. then you, you measure the biology and not uh, what happens in the water column. Mm -hmm. Right, so that's why it's advantageous to park the instrument platform uh, somewhere where there will be less biofouling. Yes, uh, mm -hmm. that, that, that's a side effect. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise you could uh, do the, the profiling also from the surface, but then you would need to, to hold your instrument in place, which is uh, not so easy. Right, right. So it's, there is another advantage of having it close to the bottom. Yes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. A disadvantage of this setup, of course, is that you don't measure uh, down to the bottom. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. You can see in this picture, perhaps you can't read it, but uh, it usually is in, in 240 meters uh, depth is the bottom. Right. And... Uh, our profiling instrumentation package is some 33 meters above the bottom. Right, right. But right. this is not so important because we, we are aiming this uh, profiling mooring at the redox climb, that is the, uh, the steep gradients in, in redox components. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, we are in marine chemistry after all. Right. And uh, so uh, the, the, the bottom is not that interesting, I, I, I say, well... At the moment. Uh, at the moment, yeah. Mm -hmm. Of course, the bottom is interesting mm -hmm. for other reasons, but mm -hmm. if you uh, are focusing on the redox climb, then it is, the, the mid-water is more interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, this thing here, uh, which uh, is called the PIP, or Profiling Instrumentation Platform, yes. from what I understand, uh, is it, it can be of basically arbitrary size, so I have seen one. Mm -hmm. I have seen one. That one is smaller than the Rosetta. Yes. Um, but there's no reason why it couldn't be bigger. I guess. Yes. In okay. in principle, uh, for for the for the underwater winch to operate, uh, you just need uh, to have something like 
10 kilograms of force pulling up here, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. just to keep the tension on that uh, on that cable here. Right, 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 right. Uh, but of course now, if if you think it, it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, if, if you have some currents uh, coming across, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, that then uh, the, the currents will move it easy, more easily mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. to the side. Right, right, and right. So uh, there is a limit to it, but uh, it's difficult to put the, the size limit uh, to put an exact number on it. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. always depends on, on how the currents are, how big the currents are. Right. So in, but in general, there is, it cannot be just arbitrarily big. No. For for the reason of the currents, and then there's the budget yeah. also. Well, <laughs> so that, the budget that, always limits. That's always the big budget. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's for sure. That I will very briefly mention here that there is. Uh, I have seen here a very very small profiling instrumentation platform, so to say. It's just a. It was just a titanium cage, relatively small, that contained only one CTD. Yeah. Maybe you want to talk mm -hmm. about that really briefly. Well, this is the. What do you mean, the, the, the CTD uh, instrument or...? Yeah, it's a, no, no, the, I meant the, the, the small uh, pip, the one that is... Yeah, the, the, the small pip, I, I don't know how well you can see it if, if you go close here. Uh, the CTD is, is just uh, the little instrument here. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you only have that, you can mm -hmm. make it a, a lot smaller, but we have a, a raft of other instruments right. here and also a data logger and, and that also mm -hmm. uh, gives uh, the, the power for, for the instrument. Right. That's why this, so, this, this pit is relatively large. This, yes. The small one only had, the, if I remember correctly, it had only one uh, CTD. It only had the CTD mm -hmm. in there uh, that had some additional sensors and then exactly. the, the, the yeah. batteries were in mm -hmm. this uh, CTD housing. Mm -hmm. So it's a, a 90 millimeters uh, diameter instrument mm -hmm. that's perhaps uh, uh, up to a meter long. Mm -hmm. so. And for that you don't even have to have a, a mooring. Okay, actually I don't know if it's used with the mooring, but I, I think it's used just with the smaller boats. Uh, you can use it with smaller boats, but uh, mm -hmm. we used it in, in the mooring, ah. yes, uh, as the, the, the first pip uh, ah, only that had that CTD in there. Ah, that was your first pip? That was our first ah. pip, yeah. And, ah, and then we got okay. uh, more funds for, for more in instruments. Right, right. I see, and, I see. Uh, yeah. So, so it, it grew a bit. Right, uh, but it's nice to see that it's still in use for some things. It's still in use for some things, and and it's uh, this instrument still is in in the bigger pip. It's right. still part of the bigger pip. It's, right. It's, uh, yeah. All right. Um, that was really great. Um, uh, so now that we have understood profiling and this uh, profiling instrumentation platforms, let's talk a little bit about the famous instruments. Yeah. Uh, in uh, and uh, in that sense, what what concerns you the most are the chemical sensors. Yes. So I, I, could you tell us a little bit about the chemical sensors with which you have worked s thus far? Yeah, well... Uh, Just uh, mention the, the most interesting ones well, in, in your opinion. Yeah, that's a, well, the most interesting one is always the one you're working on. I, I mean, oh yeah, of course. Uh, but let's leave that at last. <laughs> okay, okay, <laughs> for for so, my yeah. last Second to last question. So we, we worked on uh, on wet chemical sensors. That means we have uh, reagents mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm, th mm -hmm. that we uh, get down with the instrument, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then the re reagents are mixed with the sample water, right, with the right. seawater, uh, when you are in the water, and then a, a, a color develops, and then you measure the, the color development mm -hmm. of that, and that's a measure for how much of the target uh, reagent is in there. So which reagents have you been targeting? Well, we have uh, looked at iron 2 and manganese 2, okay. uh, uh, which means that they are the, the reduced forms of, yeah. of iron and right. manganese. Right, right. Uh, and, and this comes back to the redox uh, elements uh, mm -hmm. in, in the water column. Uh, because if you don't have oxygen there, mm -hmm. then the, the uh, Microbiology uses other things exactly. uh, to to live to to live yeah right. to to get the the energy out mm -hmm. of and so uh, yeah iron and manganese are, are two of those uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, we actually developed uh, I started the development together with a chemist in in England mm -hmm. 
and there our target was not so much the redox chemistry of the Baltic, mm -hmm. but it was uh, sniffing out hydrothermal vents. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. there are, you also have the reduced fluids coming out there, mm -hmm. and if you find uh, them still in the, in the reduced state, mm -hmm. uh, iron 2 or manganese 2, then uh, you know, ah, then, then there must be some hydrothermal activity mm -hmm. so somewhere nearby. Were you, were you looking for also for hydrogen sulfide? Uh, no, we weren't, uh, but that, that's also something you can do, mm -hmm. uh, of course, uh, but uh, we, we were not, no. Mm -hmm. Hydrogen sulfide, of course, is an interesting parameter also in the, in the chemical oceanography and also in the, in the Baltic, mm -hmm. because you have anoxic waters in the in Right, the right, right, right. So they wouldn't come from veins, but from uh, decomposing uh, yes, organics. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, 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 right. Which also is a, a source of methane, of course, in, mm -hmm. the, in the deep water. Ah, yeah, of course. Yeah, mm, we will come to that. Okay. <laughs> so, what what other what other types of of chemical sensors did you work on? Well, then uh, we are looking also at at uh, uh, chemical sensors that we just buy in. Uh, okay. That yeah. You can buy in, uh, like the uh, optical nitrate sensor, uh -huh, uh -huh. which measures uh, UV absorption. Right. Uh, nitrate absorbs in the UV. Okay. The problem there is that nitrate is not the only component in the mm -hmm. seawater, but mm -hmm. also uh, salt is a prominent uh, component, mm -hmm. of course, mm -hmm. in the seawater. Mm -hmm. and therefore, you measure a, a whole spectrum, so ah. on, on different wavelengths, okay. uh, the absorption, and then you, you fit it uh, to, the, to the calibration spectrum, right. Right, and uh, that way you find out uh, how much nitrate is in there. So basically, you, you need a spectrum analyzer to be in situ? Uh, well, a spectrum analyzer, you need, you need to take the, the absorption spectra and then mm -hmm. you, you sort of uh, process them, post-process mm -hmm. them. Uh, but you can do that in the lab uh, yeah. later on. You mm -hmm. just store the, the absorption profile, uh, mm -hmm. the absorption spectra. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. That's for nitrogen. Uh, for oxygen. For nitrate. Nitrate. Yes. nitrate. Yes. Sorry, yeah. sorry, nitrate. Yeah. Um, then uh, for oxygen, uh, there was a, another. Uh, that's also um, a sensor that you purchase. Uh, yes, uh, that's uh, nowadays we use optodes. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so that is a, a sort of a, a polymer where you have some uh, fluorophores in. So, mm -hmm. so they they are uh, reagents that fluoresce, and mm -hmm. if oxygen, the presence, okay. if oxygen is present then this fluorescence is quenched, so they don't mm -hmm. fluoresce that much mm -hmm. anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then you can, can measure the fluorescence, and the less fluorescence there is, the more oxygen there is. Right, so that would be uh, measuring the intensity of the fluorescence. But you mentioned that they, they can be also used in a different way to, uh, to measure the uh, concentration of oxygen. Well, you don't usually measure the intensity, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah. you, you measure the, the fluorescence lifetime. Exactly. So how long you, you give a, a light impulse on, mm -hmm. and then you see how long does the fluorescence last mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. until it is uh, decayed. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, you do that again and again and again, and then fast repetition, and uh, you measure the, the, the phase of the, the fluorescence signal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and that way you are independent of any uh, light that might come onto your sensor in, in, in the more shallower water. Exactly. And th th are there any other um, optical, chemical optical sensors that you can think well, of? Well, yes, uh, people are working on, on CO2 as well. Uh, that as, would be infrared, uh, then? Uh, no, no, that, that is on, uh, on, on a similar uh, uh, oh, principle, oh, yeah, CO2. Uh, ah. that there are also optoed pH sensors, I think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, bo both are not really in, in the market and, and uh, working properly. It's still under development. Ah, I see, I see. Uh, hopefully you didn't sign an NDA about this. Uh, no, no, okay. no, no. <laughs> there, there, are, there are publications about that. Ah, so, okay, so. okay, okay. All right, so finally let's talk about the uh, chemical sensors that you're working on right now. Yeah, the so most interesting ones. Yeah, the the most interesting, as, as I said, is the one uh, that that makes you trouble at, mm -hmm. the, at the moment. And uh, we are working uh, together with some French partners mm -hmm. on a methane sensor, in situ methane mm -hmm. sensor. I heard about that. <laughs> <laughs> 
funnily enough, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it, it, it's also it's uh, where the the, the the principle is an SPR sensor. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I'll take away this. Yeah. And an SPR sensor. So surface plasma resonance. Exactly. So you you really heard about that. Mm -hmm. So uh, if if you have a, a prism here uh, and you have a very thin gold layer uh, that's something like 50 nanometers of gold uh, on, on the glass prism here. Mm -hmm. Now if you shine light in, uh, it's reflected at, at, the, uh, at the surface here, mm -hmm. it goes out there, uh, and, and you can do that with... Uh, different angles, mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. you, you could have a, a converging beam here, and you have a diverging beam here mm -hmm. uh, that goes out, and here you have a, a series detector yeah, of a series of photodiodes or whatever you have. Mm -hmm. Now if you put a, a polarizer in here uh, and have P-polarized light, mm -hmm. uh, then there are uh, some conditions that under some angles here, uh, mm -hmm. the, the light is not straight reflected, but you have a surface plasmon right. it's, uh, it's in, the, in, yeah. in the gold. Yeah. And that means the energy is not reflected here, but the, the energy is, is going off uh, in, in the metal layer. Mm -hmm. It's so-called evanescent wave. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so it, uh, that then you have a sort of a dark spot here in, in your reflected light. If, if you have a converging beam here, mm -hmm. then, then somewhere in here is a, uh, a darker spot. Mm -hmm. And this, the location of that spot depends on the refractive index of the prism and the refractive index of your seawater or mm -hmm. your, your measurement medium here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we could have some kind of sensing material, a thin layer of this sensing material, uh, which senses in, in such a way that it, uh, its um, uh, diffraction coefficient, uh, sorry, diffraction coefficient changes slightly depending on the, uh, the, the ch chemicals around the, it. Yes, the, the ref refractive index. Yeah. So, so now, as a, as a sensor in the seawater, you can measure the refractive index of the seawater, uh, which mm -hmm. is uh, also of, of some interest for mm -hmm. the oceanographers because then you can infer the density of the seawater and, and mm -hmm. the salinity. The density is always interesting. Mm -hmm. um, but to make it to a chemical sensor, you don't measure the, the seawater itself, but you have a, a PDMS layer on top of this uh, 50 nanometer gold layer. Uh, it's uh, a few micrometers, uh, say five to ten micrometers thick, yeah. uh, and uh, within this PDMS layer here, uh, you have some uh, target molecules. Yeah. It's uh, it's called cryptophane A, and the, the uh, partners in in Lyon, uh, in the chemistry department in Lyon, uh, they synthesize these. Uh, the big molecules that they are big kg molecules, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and now if uh, methane dif diffuses into the PDMS, mm -hmm. it uh, fits snugly into that cryptophane A molecule, and if the cryptophane A molecules are occupied by the methane molecules, the density, the bulk density of that uh, sensitive uh, PDMS film uh, changes, and with the bulk uh, density, also the refractive index changes. Mm -hmm. So uh, the change of refractive index is a measure for how much methane uh, has diffused in. Mm -hmm. The good thing is that uh, if, if you then come in an area where there's no methane in the seawater, uh, it's a reversible effect, so, mm -hmm. so uh, it, the methane diffuses out again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, of course this is not as, as quick as, uh, for example, the temperature measurement, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it, it takes a while because the methane has to diffuse in and diffuse out right. of this. Right, right, uh, right. But of course the goal is to make it uh, 
as fast as possible so it can follow the profiling. Yes, the, the problem is uh, that they, they, these uh, evanescent waves, they are, are really sensing something uh, really close uh, to the uh, up, to, layer. Yeah, up to a few uh, wavelengths. Mm -hmm. uh, say a couple of wavelengths, and if if you have something like red light is uh, 600 nanometers, mm -hmm. around mm -hmm. 600 nanometers, mm -hmm. so it's uh, about 1200 nanometers or 1.2 micrometers mm -hmm. would be two wavelengths. Mm -hmm. So you can't make it too thin, uh, otherwise uh, you, you're also sensing a bit of the refractive index of the seawater. Right. That of course changes with, with salt and It's with not what we want to measure. Uh, you don't want uh, to measure that. Mm -hmm. uh, we still are not quite sure in how far, for example, H2S can also fit into the mm -hmm. cryptophane A. Mm -hmm. We have to find that out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we, we have a setup in the, in the laboratory, uh, but we haven't really put it in situ. Mm -hmm. But that is, that is actually connected with my uh, next question, or yes. last question, which is, as you can see, this one here. Future. <laughs> <laughs> what is the future bringing? Yes. Uh, well, hopefully it's uh, bringing a, a working methane sensor. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. that, that's uh, for one thing. Mm -hmm. If we have that, then uh, together with uh, chemists, we could look for other uh, uh, cage molecules that trap mm -hmm. other things, mm -hmm. uh, for example, and, mm -hmm. and then you could make a, a, a variety of, of different chemical sensors mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. So basically the, it would be the same setup. The same and setup. So, so the, all the development that goes into developing this methane sensor, including the in-situ version of it, yes. um, will be all a sunk cost that you can easily reuse for uh, sensing of, for instance, H2S. Exactly. Mm -hmm. that, that's the idea. But okay, so it's uh, a very, very promising uh, research because of the potential of using it for, for uh, various uh, uh, chemical... Um, yeah, that, that, that's also nice, of course, with the wet chemical sensor. Uh, you have a, a lot of wet chemical uh, uh, procedures mm -hmm. uh, that you use uh, uh, as a standard in mm -hmm. the lab. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. And that could be also implemented in, in the wet chemical sensors. Mm -hmm. Although, as, uh, in, as a developer of in-situ sensors, you, you try to avoid the wet chemical uh, sensors, mm -hmm. because that means you have reagents, and mm -hmm. your reagents uh, go off, they, they have a limited shelf life, mm -hmm. so you can't leave them in for, for long times. So mm -hmm. This profiling mooring, for example, is in for three months. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you have the reagents going off after a week, mm -hmm. uh, then uh, there's no, no use in, in measuring uh, after that uh, week, for example. So the advantage of, of the SPR-based uh, sensors is that, in principle, they could, uh, they could be used for a long uh, period of time as long as they are not fouled. Uh, yes, or at least that, that's the hope. Right? Yeah. I mean, we, we, we have to find out how long they... they uh, how, how long they really can be used in, mm -hmm. in the water. But also it's, uh, it's quite nice because uh, we, we can have uh, a setup. If, if you look at that again, I, I mean, if you change the prism for a new one, uh, then, then you have a new fresh sensor. So it's uh, easy to uh, just exchange that again. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, uh, you, we took uh, quite a bit of your time and also uh, your time. The cameraman's time. The cameraman's time. time. Uh, thank you for, to both of you and good luck for the future then. Well, thank you very much.